Can you all hear me okay? All right, good, because I can't hear you. What? I'm kidding. <laughs> all right, oh, there is so much science here, you have no idea. Uh, in, case you're, in case you're worried, in case you're worried, this is a talk about art and science coming together. There is no genocide, I swear. So, if you died sometime after 1977, there was a non-zero chance you could end up as one of these beauties. They're from the Body Worlds exhibition, which started touring the world in 1996. There are uh, four Body Worlds exhibitions still going today, including one in San Jose. Uh, it's really remarkable to see the body so accurately depicted, but nothing is really more remarkable to me than that these were real people at one point. Uh, more than 37 million people have actually been to a Body Worlds uh, exhibition in person. I went, I bet a, a lot of you have gone too. Uh, and they even showed up in that British spy documentary, Casino Royale. <laughs> if you've been to one of these exhibitions or you've seen the photos, uh, then you, you might know that they're the handiwork of Gunther von Hagens, an anatomist born in German-occupied Poland, uh, who developed a technique of preserving the body called plastination, which preserves the body by replacing the water and fat with plastics. Yay, plastics. Okay. Uh, von Hagen's first developed the plastination process 40 years ago, while other people were working on Star Wars, and has faced controversy since uh, his body's got their second life. Uh, as innovative as it was, he wasn't the first person to preserve bodies with the goal of using art and art. science, thank you, to break through the societal taboos over the public display of, the, of uh, the recently deceased. Turns out that Von Hagens wears a black fedora while he works on all the bodies, uh, from humans to giraffes. He does it in honor of Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp a mid-17th century painting depicting a human dissection. Uh, since Von Hagen sees himself as a modern-day tulp, exposing the human body for science and art, thank you, oh, we're good. He wears a fedora uh, similar to tulp's equally jaunty chapeau. But really, he should be wearing one of these badass wigs instead. This is no random, long, dead white dude in a wig either. This is Frederick Rush, uh, or Reusch, uh, who invented the idea of taking human body parts and injecting them with, basically, science. <laughs> in order to preserve, display, and analyze them. 300 years before Von Hagen's. Uh, Reusch solved one of the most pressing concerns of anatomists of his day. How can you examine the innards of the human body, or any creature for that matter, if the damn thing starts decaying as soon as it's dead? Uh, Reusch's work was a self-fulfilling curiosity. All right. Uh, his interest in answering that question led to the creation of a new kind of curiosity, the lifelike physical bodies of the dead as art. He invented... Yeah, yeah. He invented a new way to preserve bodies by injecting them with a solution. Um, everyone got their pens and papers, it's complicated. Uh, wax, resin, talcum, lavender oil, mercury sulfide, oil of olay, and other coloring agents. Uh, another source I found says that the secret ingredients were clotted pig's blood, uh, the pigment Berlin blue, and mercury oxide. Uh, well, you're already dead, it's not gonna matter. <laughs> Now, before you try this at home, that's only an approximation. The precise formula he actually kept secret until he died. But he succeeded in his self-appointed task, which was, in his words, to make the tiniest parts of the human body clear to the eye. Maybe not the atoms, but the rest he did pretty well with. By next week, I expect all of you to have your own fetal dioramas. <laughs> and that's what Rush was really known for. He was not only an anatomist, but he was also an artist. Arguably, he was an artist first, and his chosen medium was the preservation and display of the dead. Uh, with his daughter, Rachel, who was trained as a still-life artist back when that was still a viable career path, <laughs> they, would <laughs> they would arrange bodies and their component parts with the precision and grace of a Japanese ekebana expert. 
He put his arrangements on display in what were then called cabinets. He, was also, he also referred to each one as a thesaurus, a storehouse of knowledge. They were meticulously arranged dioramas of red wax filled blood vessels rising from the ground like trees. A, a cairn of gall, kidney, and bladder stones formed an altar for fetal skeletons, which were often arranged with lace collars sewn by Rachel. The tiny skeletons uh, sometimes held a, a mayfly in case you needed uh, one more symbol about the fleeting nature of life. <laughs> in one case, a human fetus was held in the mouth of a gecko. I, I presume the gecko was also dead. <laughs> in others, he places jewels in the hands of the fetuses, uh, decorated them with lace, and used fabrics to decorate the cut ends of dissected limbs. Uh, he also decorated the tops of jars in which the uh, body parts were placed, as you can see here. Uh, I was a little surprised to discover that there wasn't much public opposition to Reusch's work, which were available for public viewings twice a week. Uh, the author Judith Folkenberg says in her book on, on how the human body has been depicted from the Renaissance through till today, that there might be more opposition today than 300 years ago. Uh, Frederick Reusch might have been considered slightly odd in any society, she wrote but his preoccupations would have seemed far more natural in Baroque Holland than they would in today's world where he might, be uncomfortably, where he might uncomfortably remind people of the villain in a Thomas Harris thriller. <laughs> Here's a few more of those jars and their toppers. And dioramas that he was famous for. You, if you look, I don't know if you can see here, sort of. Uh, you can see uh, kidney stones at the base uh, the skeletons of fetuses uh, prancing around it. It is art. <laughs> he spent 30 years perfecting his preserving agents before opening his cabinets to the world. Uh, not only did he make intricate dioramas, most of which only survive in these drawings, but he also stuffed his, uh, stuffed his subjects into jars of embalming fluid uh, that he called uh, liquor uh, balsamicum. That's a fun one. Uh, he didn't only depict the body as it was commonly known, but he did preserve some pretty weird shit that you might expect uh, at a carnival sideshow. Uh, however, he really wanted to normalize the body, and he only showed off his oddities when requested, such as this two-headed fetus. If you look carefully up around the neck, you can actually see a third hand um, uh, that was part of the, uh, the, the, the fetus, unfortunately. Um, he would also decorate the tops of his jars. Uh, 900 of these jars, uh, most of which had more typical bodies or body parts in them, uh, survive to this day thanks to everyone's favorite Russian head of state. <laughs> not this guy, not this guy. Peter the Great. And in, uh, in 1717, uh, Peter met with uh, Reusch in Amsterdam and uh, the Tsar, who loved science. <laughs> oh my God, what, what happened? Oh my God, so sad. Uh, he loved science and he purchased all of Reusch's cabinets, all of them. It took a month to catalog them all. And thanks to the Great Nordic War, it took more than a year to ship them to St. Peter, Petersburg, uh, where many of them uh, are still on display. And for reasons that nobody knows, Reusch refused to help them pack them up. He took the money, which was a small fortune at the time, but he said, eh, you, you all deal with it. <laughs> he went on to build more cabinets as soon as Peter the Great had escaped back to St. Petersburg, uh, depicted in the drawings that you saw. And they were published in a 12-volume series, Thesaurus and Anato Anatomic. <laughs> I'm butchering this. Uh, Anat <laughs> Anatomicus, there we go. Uh, some of the drawings I've shown here uh, and in addition to Sar Piet and today's von Hagen's, Reusch inspired literature, including Honoré de Balzac's novel uh, La Peau de uh, Chagrin, and Italian author Giacomo Leopardi, uh, who wrote a fanciful tale about Reusch being awakened at midnight by his cadavers, all singing to him in chorus. Um, and, and as Reusch put it, I mean, sorry, as, as T.S. Eliot put it, uh, I, I think that Reusch really saw the, uh, the skull beneath the skin. Uh, but he also saw beauty and grace. He understood the importance of understanding who we are and how we function. Uh, and he realized that pursuing his curiosity about those functions was actually critical to the advancement of both artistic and scientific thought. 
and he was clever enough to make it palatable to the public. So let's raise a, gra a glass to Mr. Frederick Reusch and his cabinet of curiosities. Thank you. I didn't know about that story. I'm so glad you were